Hello Allegheny College introductory astronomy students and welcome to another introductory astronomy lecture. We've got a good one for you today brought to you by Bella and me, Jamie Lombardi. So we're recording the lecture for Wednesday, April 8th. You okay, baby? Whoa. Come back. Come back. You okay? Come here. Stay up there. <laughs> there you go, baby. So we're recording the lecture for today, Wednesday, April 8th. And we're going to start by talking about the last section of Chapter 15. Uh, this is on the center of our galaxy. And then we'll move on to Chapter 16. So these first few slides were actually prepared a few years ago by a gentleman named Frank Summers who works for the Space Telescope and Science Institute. And what they'll show us is a zoomed in, progressively zoomed in look at the center of our galaxy. The images were taken from a program called Worldwide Telescope. The plus sign here represents the direction towards the center of the galaxy. And this image is in the visible. And so you can see that dusty gas lanes prevent us from seeing down towards the very center. If I click once, we can have a little bit closer view. Um, if you look carefully here, you can see what seems to be shaped like a teapot. This is the Sagittarius constellation. And indeed, the center of our galaxy is inside of the Sagittarius constellation. If you think about this as a teapot, it's short and stout. Here's the handle back here, and here's the spout. And if you imagine water flowing out of that spout from the teapot, it would flow right here into the galactic center. So we'll make a box which is 12 degrees across, and we'll zoom in. And you can see there's not too much to see there because of that dust obscuring our view. Here's a box four degrees across, and we zoom in again. We're still looking in the visible. And yes, there are a bunch of foreground stars that happen to lie in this direction between us and the center of the galaxy. But uh, we're not able to see in the visible to the center of the galaxy. Here's a box that's one degree across and more of the same. Some stars that happen to lie in that direction, but the dust is on the other side of those stars preventing us from seeing to the center of the galaxy. A box 0.4 degrees across but this time we're going to peer through that dust by looking in wavelengths of light that is able to penetrate it. And so <clears throat> this is what we see. This is a composite image taken by three different space telescopes. The Chandra X-ray Telescope, which shows us the blues in this image. The Hubble Space Telescope, which is here imaging in the near infrared. And there the colors have been shown as yellow and the Spitzer Space Telescope, with his, which is an infrared observatory. And there, its image is shown to us in red. And those three separate images are superposed on top of one another to make this composite image. Notice that the way that they choose these false colors, because we can't see X-ray, we can't see infrared, is that the shortest wavelength light, the X-rays, are the blue, and the longest X uh, wavelength light, the far infrared, are the reds. And then the middle wavelength, which in this case is the near infrared, is the yellow. And you can see a lot of different structures have been labeled for us. There are these arched filaments, which presumably are following the field lines, the magnetic field lines of the galaxy. There are clusters of stars like the Arches cluster, cluster and the Quintuplet Cluster. The Pistol Star may have been shot out of the Quintuplet Cluster. And uh, here is a single X-ray binary. And so that is a compact object with an accretion disk around it that is very hot in the X-ray and therefore admits in the X-ray. And so over here, though, this is really where I want to draw your attention. This is Sagittarius A star. And this is what we call, quote unquote, the center of the galaxy. All of this region is part of the galactic center. But as we'll learn in Sagittarius A star, there's a black hole that's 4 million times the mass of our sun. If you look in the lower left here, you can see a bar which indicates lengths here at this distance. 
And so it's about 50 light years from one side of this bar over to the other bar. And so it's between 100 and 200 um, light years from, uh, at least in projected distance, from this X-ray binary over to Sagittarius A star. There's a lot going on in a relatively small region of space. So as I was saying, that composite image was made by superposing three separate images. And let's take a look at each of those images individually. First, the Chandra X-ray telescope image here. And you can see Sagittarius A star um, has a lot of X-ray emission from its vicinity. There's a lot of hot gas that is in the vicinity of that black hole. Here we have the near infrared. Now remember, infrared wavelengths are longer wavelengths than visible. And those longer wavelengths lights are able to penetrate more easily through the dust. The X-ray radiation is short wavelength, it's true. But it is able to, because of how energetic it is, get through a portion of the light between the galactic center and here. And even though a lot of it is blocked, enough still remains for us to image it with Chandra. And so you see different things in the Chandra image than you see in the near-infrared image. By looking at astronomical objects in general in different wavelength regimes, we learn different things. We can probe those objects in different temperature regimes. And so uh, here we can go from, as well, the near-infrared to the far-infrared and learn even more. So here in the far infrared, that has been imaged by the Spitzer telescope. And so when we uh, look in detail at that Spitzer image, because those last images were zoomed out, but they actually have much higher resolution than you might at first realize just looking from those images, you zoom in on different portions of it, you can see some remarkably detailed uh, images of what's happening in the galactic center. So over here on the left, we see in the vicinity of the black hole, Sagittarius A star, you see this infrared radiation um, corresponding to what appears to be some kind of disc-like structure of gas orbiting around that black hole. Over here, you see the uh, sickle and little fingers that point out that are being sculpted by nearby bright, newly formed, presumably, stars. And their stellar winds and radiations are pushing outward on that surrounding nebula and forming that boundary with those little fingers within it. Perhaps at the tips of some of those fingers, new stars will form. Um, and you also see these filaments as well. Here in the lower right, you see those filaments, those arched filaments that are presumably following the local magnetic field. Um, so there again is the uh, composite image of all of these things. And uh, today's astronomy picture of the day, I decided to postpone until this point. I picked one from about a week ago. I'm recording this on April 7th, and so it was one week ago, on March 31st of this year, 2020. And now that we've seen this introduction, we'll be able to appreciate better this astronomy picture of the day. What this is showing us is a composite image again, very similar to the one that you just looked at. But now what's being shown are Chandra images and uh, a radio image. So it's yet another wavelength. And that's why this looks different than before. Here's the Sagittarius A star over on the right side. Here on the left side is that X-ray binary that we talked about before. And now in the radio, which is even longer wavelength light than the near or far infrared, we see additional structures. There's those arches we could see before, um, but here are some new arches. They're called arcs that follow again along the magnetic field lines of the galaxy. If we get back to the PowerPoint, we can compare the images that we were just looking at with the one from today's astronomy picture of the day. Here I've taken the astronomy picture of the day and I've zoomed in on the region so that we can see how it overlaps with what we had just been talking about. And so you can see now in the radio you learn yet additional information about the gas and how it's distributed. All right, I said there was a black hole at the center of the galaxy. How do we know it? It's thanks to observations done 
um, by the Keck UCLA Galactic Center Group. And so they're using the telescopes based out of Hawaii. And since about 1994, 1995, they've been observing the orbits of these so-called S stars as they move around. So they peer through the dust uh, by using these longer wavelength observ observations. And what do they see? Well, they see objects that whip around on uh, timescales of uh, decades. Some of these stars, these so-called S stars, they've been able to follow for more than one complete orbit. And we know Kepler's laws that mass times the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. And so they are measuring the orbital period by other means, and we'll be discussing ways very soon in chapter 16 about how you measure distances. You can figure out how broad these orbits are. And then taking into account projection effects, they can determine what the mass is of the object that's being orbited around. What's great about this is we have lots of objects, several objects, all orbiting the black hole at the same time. And so with each additional object that you monitor, you can get an independent measurement of the mass of the system and thereby check and more accurately determine the mass that you are calculating for that black hole that's being orbited around. And so let's watch this again, like watch this star come in and whip around and go back out. Um, it gets very close to the black hole in the process. It has this highly eccentric orbit. And the mass that you calculate from applying Kepler's laws in each of these cases is 4 million solar masses. It's in a small enough region, as we'll discuss, that it can't be explained by anything other than a black hole. Now that black hole is for the most part rather quiet in the sense that although there's x-ray emitting gas from the vicinity, it's usually not flaring up. However, there have been and there are occasions where you do get x-ray flares from the center there. And what's thought to be happening in these cases is that little morsels of gas are being eaten up by that black hole. And as they fall down in onto that black hole and the object is disrupted, it gets hotter and emits in the X-ray. And actually, as we'll discuss in more detail later, it's from the variability of these X-rays that you can put a limit on how big this black hole system must be. Because anything that changes brightness quickly needs to be very small. If it's big, then it's impossible to change its brightness quickly just because of the light travel time across the object. If something's one light year across, then it takes at least one year for the object to turn off because even if you turned it off instantaneously, light from the back side would reach you a year after light from the front side. And so even if you instantaneously turned it off, what someone would observe would be it turning off over a course of a year. So if you see something fluctuating quickly, then you could put limits on how big it is. And we've been able to put this object to a small enough size that it couldn't be explained by anything other than a black hole. In chapter 16, we're gonna talk about galaxies in general. We've been talking about our own Milky Way galaxy, and now we'll talk about galaxies in general. This is analogous to what we did a few chapters ago where we talked about our sun, and then we talked about how stars in general behave. And here's a beautiful image of a galaxy. It's got this long tail that's coming off of it, this streamer, if you will. And we see in the background, not stars, but these objects are galaxies here. And so these are the types of things that we're gonna be talking about in chapter 16. We'll be talking about galaxies and cosmology. What cosmology is, is the study of the universe on its largest scale. And so this is going to be intimately linked to galaxies, how they form, how they evolve in time. And in cosmology, we'll talk about not only the past of the universe, but what we expect the future of the universe to be as well. Now, there are three major types of galaxies. Let's take a look at what those may be like with the help of images from the Hubble Space Telescope. First of all, this is just an image of the sky. You may notice here the Big Dipper. There's Alcor and Mizar. Here are the pointer stars pointing to Polaris in the little 
Dipper. And we're going to zoom in on a patch of the sky which was chosen by Hubble scientists because it was particularly unspecial. It was a region where your view was not obscured by dust or gas in the plane of the Milky Way, but rather just a dark patch in the sky. And they pointed the telescope to that patch in the sky for weeks on end and just gathered as much light as they could. The size of the sky that they're looking at is no larger than a dime held 70 feet away. So it's this tiniest little patch in the sky. And what do you see there? You see thousands of galaxies. This experiment was repeated with what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And again, it's in a different direction, but statistically you see the same thing. Thousands of galaxies that come into these three main categories that we're about to discuss. But there's a galaxy, there's a galaxy, there's a galaxy. Everything you see in here is a galaxy. Some of them look like just little dots, but those are because they're galaxies that are far away. The first galaxy I want to draw your attention to is this one. And in this zoomed out image, we don't get to appreciate just how much resolution there is in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. We can zoom in on any portion of this image that we want, including that galaxy. Here's what we see for that galaxy. And you can see it has spiral arms. Notice these arms that wind as you come outward from the galaxy. They wind outward, these so-called spiral arms. And so that's an example of a spiral galaxy. Here, this galaxy is known as an elliptical galaxy. It's roundish. And finally, there are examples in here of what are called irregular galaxies. They don't have a regular morphology associated with them. And these are the three main categories of galaxies. Let's talk about each one of them a little bit more carefully. Spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies are defined by having a nice disk-like structure to them. There's a component of it which is flat, like our Milky Way is an example of a spiral galaxy. And there is also the halo and the uh, bulge. Those are uh, other portions of the galaxy. We'll call them the spheroidal component. The bulge is a spheroidal piece in the center with old stars in it. The halo surrounds the galaxy and embedded within that would be the globular clusters. Here is another example of a spiral galaxy, but now seen more from the edge. And you can get a feeling here in this image just how flat those disks are. You can also see some of the dust that accumulates within the glass clouds of that disk. You also get a better view from the side here of that spheroidal component that I was talking about. You can see how it's roundish in the center and you can imagine having a rounder distribution as you move outward into the halo. Now the disk stars are of all ages, like in our Milky Way and there are gas clouds all around forming new generations of stars. The spheroidal component consists of old stars, and there will be few gas clouds that remain to make new generations of stars, which is why they're all old. Here's another image, but now face-on, of a spiral galaxy. And uh, once, one thing to notice here is that these stars here in the center are yellow and orangish, and towards the outside, they're bluish white. And in fact, uh, another thing to note about these is that the motions of these stars is going to be different. These disk component stars, they're just going to be bobbing up and down as they orbit more or less circularly around the center of the galaxy. Whereas the stars in the spheroidal component, like the bulge, for example, they have random orientation. Some are moving from above the galaxy to below, and some from below to above. Some might be going more clockwise when viewed from one direction, and others, when viewed from the same direction, are counterclockwise, and so on and so forth. Here's a thought question for you. I mentioned the different colors. Um, those blue-white stars um, are due to what? Why does, uh, due to star formation. So why does ongoing star formation lead to a blue-white appearance? Remember those in the disk are forming 
those in the bulge, they're no longer having stars in the process of form. That's going to explain this difference in color. Why does ongoing star formation lead to a blue-white appearance? A, there aren't any red or yellow stars. B, short-lived stars, short-lived blue stars outshine the others. Or C, gas in the disk scatters blue light. All right, you can pause it there if you like. Okay, well, the answer is not A. There certainly are blue and yellow stars in the disk of the galaxy, because when you make stars, you make stars of all types. The idea, though, is that even though there are many blue and yellow, uh, many red and yellowish stars in the disk, the blue ones are so many orders of magnitude brighter that they outshine the others. The answer here is B. Those red and orange stars in the bulge, those are because the bold stars are old. And if they're old, that means that enough time has passed that any hot blue main sequence stars will have evolved on to later stages of evolution to become red giants and maybe even to blow up in supernova explosions. Either way, those blue main sequence stars don't remain any longer. Remember when we talked about clusters of stars and the main sequence turnoff? We said that as time goes on, the main sequence turnoff worked down, its, down the main sequence, starting with the blue stars and then going deeper and deeper to lower and lower mass stars. So those blue stars are the first ones to leave the main sequence. And once they do, they leave behind the red and the orange colors. You might wonder, okay, is it gas in the disk that's scattering the blue light? And it's true that light is scattered by gas in the disk, but it redirects that light. And if there are stars in that disk that are red to begin with, if you're looking at them, they would still, if you look directly at them, they would have blue light scatter out of the way. And so it's not just the scattering that makes it more blue. In order for it to be blue, there has to be blue light to originate there in the disk. And that blue light is uh, originating from the brightest blue newly formed mass of stars. Okay, so among the spirals, there's a subcategory of barred spirals, and you can see why they're called this. Here's a bar that's going across the central bulge, and so you go outwards a ways along a straight line before the arm then starts be to begin to unwind. This is a two-armed bar spiral in this particular case. Lenticular galaxies are kind of a fourth class of galaxies, if you will. They are intermediate. They are between spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies that we're about to discuss. They do have a disk component like spiral galaxies, but they don't have well-defined spiral arms that wind as you go outward. They also have less dusty gas in them than your typical spiral galaxy. And so here you can kind of see there is some gas indeed in these lenticulars, but they don't follow that spiral arm pattern like in a typical spiral arm, spiral galaxy. Elliptical galaxies are spheroidal, they're roundish, and they basically have no disk component associated with them. So the motions of stars in elliptical galaxies are like the motions of stars in the bulge or halo of a disk galaxy. In other words, they're randomly oriented. Some of these arrows here in this diagram are going one way, some are going the other, some as viewed from above are going counterclockwise, some clockwise. It's all mixed up. There's no overall pattern of motion in terms of the direction or orientation of these orbits. And that's true throughout the galaxy, in the center of the galaxy, the middle, the edge, and so on. So Hubble first made this so-called tuning fork diagram, and when he first wrote it down, he was hoping that this diagram would be to galaxies and galaxy evolutions what the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram was to stars and star evolutions. And so the idea here is that you have elliptical galaxies over on the left. This number zero to five is representing how round the galaxy is. As you go to E5, E4, E3, E2, E1, E0, you get to rounder and rounder elliptical galaxies. 
And then over here we have the spirals and then the barred spirals. And if you imagine looking at this from the side, you would think about it as looking like a tuning fork. You know, these instruments um, that people use to tune musical instruments. You get a little um, hammer and you hit the tuning fork and it vibrates and it has a certain note that it plays. And then you play your violin and you adjust the tightness in the string until the pitch of your violin note that you're playing matches the pitch of the tuning fork. And so this looks like a tuning fork from the side, and so that's why it's called the tuning fork diagram. But you can see here as we go S, A, S, B, S, C, we're getting to smaller bulges, more dusty gas lanes, and looser spiral arms. Here in an SC, these spiral arms are very, very loosely wound, whereas we go to SB a little more tightly, SA very tightly still. The barred spirals are similar, but they have a capital B in the middle of their name, SBA, SBB, SBC, and that capital B reminds us that there is a bar before the spiral arms begin. These are the lenticular galaxies that I mentioned and they are those intermediate galaxies between ellipticals and spirals. Now, our Milky Way galaxy is an SBB, and that's only really been known for about 20 years or a little less that it, we were certain that it was a barred spiral galaxy. We've known for many years that it's an ellip... Uh, <laughs> we've known for many years that it's a spiral galaxy. But the fact that it's a barred spiral galaxy was tricky to determine because of what we were talking about at the beginning of class today, that it's difficult to see down towards the center of the Milky Way because our view is obscured, at least in wavelengths of light like the visible. And so we had to trace things out carefully, looking at the Milky Way from the inside and been able to determine that indeed the center appears to have a bar-like structure. So here's an artist's conception that if we were able to get outside of our Milky Way and take a picture of it and send it back, what it would look like. Now, those irregular galaxies were the third category of galaxies that I mentioned. They don't have an overall regular shape. And you might wonder a couple things about them. Why are they more often blue? Um, well, that blue or bluish white appearance again, has to do with star formation. That galaxies that are forming stars are gonna have more blue objects within them, they're gonna appear blue. Why are they forming stars? Well, the reason we think irregular galaxies have the shape they do, or the shapes that they do, is because they're in the process of forming. Maybe two galaxies are colliding, and in the process of their collision, you get these irregular shapes. I picked out a visualization to show you. Um, it compares the simulation that was done by a couple scientists with Hubble Space Telescope images. And so um, let's go ahead and take a look at it now. So this is the simulation. This is an actual HST observation there that they showed us for a second. So you can see that the two look similar to one another. As these galaxies collide, you could pause this at various moments like here and notice that there's no well-defined overall shape. If you saw something like this in the universe, you'd say, oh, that's an irregular galaxy. But what you've done is you've captured galaxies in the process of colliding. And if you look at this from the right vantage point, you can see that there are actually real systems. Here's a Hubble Space Telescope image that looks very much like that snapshot as those two galaxies were colliding. Here you get these tidal tail features, right, where you have these streams of stars that are left behind. They're called tidal tails because it's those same kind of tidal forces we've talked about in different contexts before. Tidal forces we use to explain the tides on Earth. Tidal forces we talked about in the context of an astronaut falling into a black hole and being pulled apart, or stars falling into black hole and being pulled apart. 
here the tidal forces from one of these galaxies is acting on the other. So it's pulling more strongly on the near side of the galaxy than it does on the middle, than it does on the far side. And so the galaxy is being pulled out from underneath the stars on the far side and this tail um, is then pulled off of the galaxy. So look at that, qualitatively and even to an extent um, more so than that. There's nice agreement between that simulation and those um, observations. Again, there's a Hubble Space Telescope image very much like what's going on in the simulation here. So one nice thing, of course, about the simulation is that you're able to view it from many different vantage points. Of course, when you're using the Hubble Space Telescope, you are fixed at planet Earth to do the observations because the Hubble is orbiting around planet Earth and the galaxies far, far away are always going to be viewed from the same vantage point. So that was a beautiful um, set of work that was done there. Um, the uh, scientists were uh, Chris Mijos, Lars Hernquist, and the visualization was done by Frank Summers, the same Frank Summers I mentioned earlier today. So here's a beautiful HST image of the Cartwheel Galaxy. Um, you can see why it's called a Cartwheel Galaxy. It kind of looks like a cartwheel over here. We're zoomed in on the center of the galaxy in the lower left and on this star forming region which is a ring around the center of the galaxy. And these are two smaller galaxies off to the right here. And what people think happened was in the past, one of these two galaxies came right through the center of the disk of this other galaxy and sent out a shock wave through the gas. And as that shock wave propagates outward, the compression associated with it will trigger star formation. And that's why you have this blue ring of stars here, which presumably over time is expanding outward as stars are formed as a result of that compression or shock wave. So galaxies are grouped together. Um, it depends on what type of galaxy you're talking about as to how they'll be grouped. Disc-shaped galaxies, spiral galaxies, are called, um, their groupings are called groups like the Milky Way galaxy is in the local group with a few other dozen galaxies, including Andromeda. Andromeda is a spiral galaxy. It's the biggest galaxy in the local group. It's the closest big galaxy to us here in the Milky Way. And so typically groups of galaxies will have a few dozen galaxies within them. Elliptical galaxies are found in what are called clusters. And clusters have many more galaxies in them than groups do. Clusters typically have hundreds or even thousands of galaxies, and they're bunched close together in space. This is a hint as to how elliptical galaxies formed, because if you have a large number of galaxies clustered close together, you would rightly expect that there were a lot of collisions in the past. And in fact, it very, mal very may well be that elliptical galaxies formed in the past through multiple collisions and mergers of galaxies. That maybe two galaxies that at first were, you know, normal old disk galaxies collide, but then their orbits get mis mixed up and a third galaxy comes in and a fourth and a fifth. And by the time that several galaxies have merged all together into one, there's no longer a well-defined pattern of motion among the stars. And you have those random orientations of stellar orbits associated with elliptical galaxies, you have those elliptical shapes that you have associated with these galaxies. Now, in the second section of chapter 16, we will talk about ways to measure distances to objects. Lots of times, arguments in astronomy are settled once astronomers determine what the distance to an object is. How do we do it? Looking at the brightness of an object is not enough to figure out how far away it is. Let's say that we're looking at two objects here and they, to our eyes, appear to be the same brightness as one another. 
but uh, one is a candle that's just held up close to our face, and the other is a lighthouse that is sufficiently far away that by the time the light from it gets to us, it's just appearing to be as bright as the candlelight. And so the idea here is that the brightness that something appears with is going to depend not only on its intrinsic brightness, but also on the distance that it is away. Here, in a more astronomical context, you could imagine looking at two different stars. One of them is intrinsically brighter than the other. This may be the one that's more intrinsically bright, but it appears dimmer than this object just because it's so much further away, right? And so if you put the lighthouse far enough away, it certainly could appear dimmer than the candle that you have just a few centimeters from your eye. And so just because this star here appears brighter in the sky doesn't necessarily mean that it is intrinsically brighter than this star. All right, so let's go on and talk then about how it is that we do measure distances. We use techniques that overlap with one another and that are independent of one another. And we'll go through each of these steps a little bit more carefully to finish off class today. The first step will be to use radar to measure distances to things nearby within our own solar system. We'll use the method of parallax that we've mentioned before to measure distances to nearby stars in our galaxy. The distance of uh, stars uh, in clusters can be achieved through main sequence fitting, as we'll discuss. And then we can get to nearby galaxies using Cepheid and other variable stars, and there will be some distant standards, such as white dwarf supernovae, that are going to allow us to measure distances to very far away galaxies. So let's start by talking about radar. Uh, people who fish, they use sonar and radar in the following way. Uh, they will shine that radar down, and it will bounce back. And from how long it takes that radar signal to go down to the base of the pond and then back up again, they could determine how far away the base of the pond is. Um, you use the same technique here, but with um, radio telescopes like Arecibo put in transmission mode rather than in receiving mode. So if you send a radar pulse at Venus, for example, and then the pulse goes to Venus and bounces back. And it says uh, here it takes seven minutes in this orientation for the light to go there and back. Well, we know how quickly light travels. So we can figure out how far the light, that radar pulse, had traveled. Remember, radar is a type of radio wave, which is a type of light. So it travels at the speed of light, three times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so if you know how long it takes, you can multiply by the speed to figure out how far the radar was. Divide that by two, and that's the distance to the object that the radar bounced off of. If we instead measured the distance to Mercury, well, to Venus, it took seven minutes for the radar to go there and back. Mercury's farther away. It took 12.8 minutes. Or here's Mars all the way over here on the other side of the inner solar system. There, it took nearly 40 minutes for the radar to go there and back. So the farther away the object is, the longer it takes for the um, pulse to go there and back. So that allows us to measure distances to objects within our own solar system and determine things like an astronomical unit, which is 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers, to remarkable accuracy. What if you want to go outside of our own solar system? Radar doesn't work anymore. Right? You'd have to wait too long for something to bounce off, plus the time, by the time the signal got back to you, it'd be too weak to detect. And so we need to use a different technique. Step two is this technique of parallax. And we've talked about this before. Remember, put your finger in front of your nose and then look at your finger with your right eye and then your left eye and your right eye. If you can't blink your eyes, you might need to use your hand to cover up each of your eyes and turn. And you see your finger jump from one side of the room to the other side of the room. The further away your finger is, the less it jumps. The closer you get your finger to your nose, the bigger the angular jump. 
Now your two eyes here are analogous to the position of the Earth at two different moments in its orbit. So if you look at a nearby star in January, it's going to appear on the left side of the distant stars behind it. If you wait six months for the Earth to be over here at its location in July, now that nearby star is in front of the stars on the right when placed in front of those distant stars. And so you can see it's flip-flopping between this location in January and that location in July. This angle P is called the parallax angle, and that is inversely proportional to the distance to the object. The answer to today's reading quiz is going to be parallax. P-A-R-A-L-L-A-X, parallax. Okay, step three is going to make use of standard candles, as is step four and step five and step six. So we're gonna talk about what we mean by standard candles right now, and then we'll talk about each of these steps individually. So the first thing to appreciate is that there's a relationship among how bright something appears, how bright it intrinsically is, that's the luminosity, and the distance to the object. If we look at this little figure here, we can think about a source of light at the center. And that light is shining out over larger and larger regions of space. Once it's shown out um, to a distance of one astronomical unit, it would spread out over a sphere which has a surface area of four pi times its radius squared. The radius here is just the distance that that light has traveled. If you allow that light to shine out to two astronomical units or three astronomical units, then it gets spread out over increasingly larger spheres. By the time it it's shined out to three astronomical units, um, that same patch of light shown by this cone here is now not spread out over just one little um, rectangle, but nine of these rectangles. It gets spread out by a factor of three in this direction and three in this direction. And if you think about it, this sphere uh, on the outside, which is three times the radius of the sphere in the middle, has nine times the area because its surface area goes by four pi, the distance or radius squared. So you make that radius three times larger. Three squared means it's nine times the area. So what you can do is you can think about the luminosity coming out. That's an energy per time. And then in the denominator, that is the area over which all of that luminosity is spread. Larger distances mean more area gets spread out at, which means that a detector at that distance would detect it as being less bright. So that's the mathematical equation between brightness and luminosity and distance. Often we rearrange that because for standard candles, the definition of these things is going to be by some means, we know intrinsically how bright it is. We know what its luminosity is. So luminosity is a known quantity. You can get out your detector and measure how bright it appears. And then you solve this equation for distance, right? By isolating distance. And you find distance is this, the square root of luminosity over four pi times brightness. You plug in for luminosity and brightness, you calculate the distance. I want to emphasize that knowing the brightness alone is not enough to determine the distance because there you only know the denominator of this expression. Imagine that you had two light bulbs, a 15 watt light bulb that was one meter from you and a 60 watt light bulb that was two meters from you. The 60 watt bulb is obviously intrinsically brighter, but its additional distance makes it makes that brightness um, fall off by a larger percentage than what occurs for the light bulb that's only one meter away. And you could, by appropriately balancing the distance to these two different wattage light bulbs, make one to appear just as bright as the other. If you make the object twice as far away, but it has four times the luminosity, four times the wattage, then it would appear to be just as bright. So 
what kind of standard candles can we make use of? Remember, these are objects whose luminosity we can determine without knowing the distance. Well, in step three, what we make use of is the fact that main sequences are well understood. And if you can find a star on a main sequence, you've seen many other stars like that star in the past, and you have, um, for those other stars, maybe they were close enough to determine the distance by parallax, um, you know what their intrinsic brightness is, and so this one should be no different than all the others. Here, if you take the Hyades and Pleiades open clusters as an example, those two open clusters you know about in the Taurus the Bull constellation. On the vertical axis here, we have their apparent brightness. On the horizontal axis, we have their temperature. And the Hyades stars appear brighter than their corresponding Pleiades counterparts. Why is that? Nothing that big of a reason other than the Hyades is closer, right? That's why it's seven and a half times brighter than the Pleiades. And that's consistent with what you know about the Hyades and Pleiades. Remember, the Hyades is the face of the bull, and it's rather spread out in the sky. The Pleiades is in the back of the bull, and it's a smaller little region. It's smaller in that angular sense, largely because it's further away. And so... The apparent brightness of a star on the cluster's main sequence is going to tell us its distance. Let's think about that in a little more detail here. The Hyades is close enough that we can measure the distance to its stars using parallax. It's about 150 light years away. Now, as you go to more and more larger distances, to hundreds and several hundreds of light years away, this parallax technique doesn't become practical any longer because the stars simply have too small of a parallax angle to be able to reliably measure. So with the Hipparchus satellite, you can stretch it out and get out to a thousand or a little more light years away. Um, but with ground-based measurements, you're not gonna be able to measure much further than a couple hundred or so oh, light years. Now, um, the Hyades is measured by parallax to be 150 light years away. We know the Pleiades is on a uh, spectral type by spectral type basis comparison, seven and a half times dimmer. What does that mean? Well, it means that the Pleiades must be the square root of 7.5 times further away. Imagine to keep the numbers a little simpler, that the Pleiades were nine times dimmer than the Hyades stars. Nine times dimmer could occur if it were three times further away because then the light would have been spread out over an area that was three squared or nine times larger. And so to go backwards, you say, oh, if it's nine times dimmer, I take the square root of nine or three. It's three times further away. But here it's seven and a half times dimmer. I take the square root of 7.5 to figure out how many times further away the Pleiades is. And the square root of, of 7.5, we know, is between 2 and 3. Um, and so it turns out when you do that multiplication, you get around 410 light years. Step 4 is the Cepheid variables. And this is the second of our standard candles that we'll discuss. Cepheid variables are stars that oscillate. And as they oscillate, their brightness changes. They lie in a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram along this instability strip. And perhaps the most famous of all the Cepheid variables is good old Polaris, the North Star. It changes in its brightness over time and uh, it, with a well-defined periodic relationship. And so let's say that you're an astronomer and you have observed many of these Cepheid variables. And maybe you have... Uh, measured the distance to many of these Cepheid variables by parallax or main sequence fitting. And you establish then a relationship that you notice that the luminosity of that Cepheid variable, which you'll plot here on the vertical axis, is correlated with its orbital, um, is correlated with its oscillation period. And so you notice that, oh, Cepheid variables with a three-day oscillation period are almost 1,000 luminosities. A 10-day period, almost 3,000 luminosities. A 30-day period, almost 10,000 luminosity, solar luminosities, and so on and so forth. So you establish this relationship empirically. 
Then once you know that it exists, you go and you measure the oscillation period of some new Cepheid variable, maybe one that's too far away to measure its distance by other techniques. And, oh, well, you've measured its period. You can then figure out what its luminosity must be. And if you know its luminosity and you measure how bright it appears, you can calculate the distance to that standard candle. Step five is the Tully-Fisher relation. And this is the third of the standard candles that we'll discuss. Here, what we have is a galaxy. The galaxy is going to be rotating. The faster it rotates, the brighter the galaxy is. Again, this is an empirical relationship that has been established. The faster it rotates, the brighter it is. That makes sense because if something's rotating faster, there must be a lot of mass that's holding it in place at that fast rotation speed. And if there's a lot of mass, you might think a lot of stars have formed. And if there are a lot of stars, it should be brighter. And so we're not surprised that this relationship exists. But then once we establish it, maybe by, you know, observing nearby galaxies whose distances could be um, understood with the help of Cepheid and other variable stars, uh, you establish that relationship. And then you look far away at some galaxy that you haven't yet measured the distance to. And you say, well, I can measure its rotation speed using the Doppler effect. I look at how fast stars on one side are moving, how fast stars on the other side are moving with the help of Doppler shifts. Once you know the rotation speed, you can say, okay, let's say this is the rotation speed. Um, that means that this galaxy has 10 to the 10, 10 billion solar luminosities. And now if you know the intrinsic brightness from this Tully-Fisher relationship, you measure how bright the object appears by you know, observing it with your telescope and a CCD camera, then you can calculate the distance to the object. And the a final step that we'll mention today uh, will be white dwarf supernovae. Remember, we talked about white dwarf supernovae before, and they occur when white dwarfs that are 1.4 solar masses at, uh, blow up. Their mass is increasing up to that limit of 1.4 solar masses due to accretion from a companion. And so once it gets above that Chandrasekhar mass limit, the white dwarf mass limit, then the star will start to implode and then the fusion throughout it will blow it to smithereens. Since all these white dwarf supernovae happen essentially the same way, they all have the same peak luminosity associated with them. Well, that's all that we have time for today. Um, we will pick up next time by summarizing about these uh, white dwarf supernovae and how the uh, different distance scale indicators work together as a whole before we move onward into chapter 16. I hope you're doing well. Stay safe and take care.